this was what the moon looked like 47 years ago today. That's one of my earliest memories, actually. Um, it's just a coincidence it coincides with today. It's a Tuesday, I think it was. And uh, my father had taken me outside to show me the moon. And he told me, you know, right now there are astronauts up there walking on the moon. And this was the Apollo 17 mission. And that's the location, the Mare Serenatus, where they were doing their moonwalk that day. And then in two days' time, they actually departed the moon, the last mission to the moon. And I want to show you just a, a little clip of this departure. It's the only successful footage that we have of the journey back home. Houston, before we uh, close out our EVA, probably one of the most significant things we can think about when we think about Apollo is that it has opened for us, for us being the world, a challenge of the future. The door is now cracked, but the promise of that future lies in the young people, not just in America, but the young people all over the world, learning to live and learning to work together. In order to remind all the peoples of the world, in so many countries throughout the world, that this is what we all are striving for in the future, American challenge of today as Forge Man's destiny of tomorrow. And as we leave the moon and Taurus Luchel, we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed to crew of Apollo 17. Beautiful speech there by Eugene Cernan, the lead astronaut. You might think they actually left an astronaut behind on the moon, but that was uh, remote footage from the camera that was placed on the lunar rover. Now, this was a recent image taken by the Lu Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter, and you can still see the, the tracks there, the landing base um, from 47 years ago, and those tracks, those footprints, will probably remain for about 100,000 years until they're erased by uh, asteroids. And I think, you know, there's a lot of garbage there, so we do need to go back and clean that up, actually. It's uh, not a very Swiss thing, is it, to leave all those tracks and, and garbage there. Now, so what, what, how did all this happen? Well, the, the Apollo mission, getting to the moon was a consequence of, of the Cold War, this sort of struggle of ideology between communism and capitalism. And during the 60s, President Lyndon Johnson of America, he, he said, whoever rules space rules the world. And they increased the budget of NASA by a factor of 10 to develop the program, the Apollo program, to put astronauts on the moon. And the Soviets were doing this uh, as well. And the, the second rocket there from the end was the, the secret Soviet N1 rocket, almost as big as the Saturn rocket. But it kept exploding on launch. So it, it never successfully left the Earth. Whereas the Americans, they had so many people working on the Apollo program, the Saturn V rocket there on the end, 110 meters tall, developed, the Apollo program was developed by 400,000 people and from 20,000 different universities and companies were working on this program. It cost about $150 billion in today's money to get to the moon. Now that rocket there is, is an enormous thing and you can't really appreciate it until you hear the sound of a Saturn V rocket in a good sound system, which this room has. So let me just show you what a launch sounds like. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0.
puts Elon Musk's rockets, like they look like toys compared to that. Now, as you know, the, the political legacy of the Apollo program was enormous. Lyndon B. Johnson was correct in, in his words. But there's also a scientific legacy, which I want to talk about now. And it, you know, it's more than just driving around the moon on electric cars in the 1970s. That was impressive enough. But the scientific legacy tells us, gives us the clues to understand the origin of our moon. So the Apollo astronauts, they brought back 380 kilograms of moon rocks, which are stored in two high-security vaults. This is one of them. This is more secure than where half of you have got your money stored on the Barnovstrasse. Um, this is super high security. And the reason is, is that what's stored in there is the most valuable thing by weight that exists on our planet. Just last year at Sotheby's, 0.2 grams of Soviet moon rocks that they brought back from a robotic mission, this was sold for $855,000, a millimeter-sized grain. NASA have got 380 kilograms of this stuff. That's about a trillion dollars in that vault. It's pretty impressive. They even trusted the scientists with some of this rock, and, but this carefully, you have to be very careful and give it back after you've analyzed it. And, this was one of the main scientific legacies. When scientists looked at these rocks to, to see what they're made of, well, it's just a rock, nothing special, but those rocks are identical to the rocks on Earth. The isotopes, of, the fractions of the isotopes of oxygen, titanium, and so on, are identical to Earth rocks. That's a huge clue in understanding the origin of our moon. The next clue comes from an experiment that were put on the surface of the moon, these seismic detectors to detect moonquakes. So when an asteroid hits the moon, it causes it to vibrate, and then these detectors pick up that vibration. You can figure out what's inside the moon. This was another surprise. At the center of the moon is a tiny iron core, just one or two percent of the mass of the moon. Compared to the Earth, where we also measure the internal structure using earthquakes, the Earth is 33 percent iron. It's got an enormous iron core. So that's another interesting clue as to understanding the moon's origin. And then the third clue that's important was this simple little mirror that was placed on the moon. What astronomers can do is shine a laser pulse at the moon and time how long it takes to get back to Earth. It's about two and a half seconds at the speed of light to get to the moon and back. But they can measure the distance to the moon to an accuracy of just one millimeter. And what you find is that the moon is actually moving away from the Earth. We're losing it at about four centimeters a year. And the reason for that is, is fascinating and the physics of this was worked out in the 19th century. It's related to how the moon causes the tides on Earth. The gravity of the moon is a little bit stronger on the side of the Earth that faces the moon. It's weaker on the far side. And this gravitational tidal field squeezes the Earth into an egg shape. And that egg shape is always pointing towards the moon. And when the oceans are piling up into these bulges, if you imagine standing on the Earth as it spins around once a day, you pass through these two bulges, two tidal bulges, which is why there are two tides a day. Now, this is a little bit complicated to visualize. I'll try it anyway. As the Earth spins, it takes time for the water to fall off those bulges, so it's dragged ahead, which means there's a mass of water slightly leading the position of the Earth pointing towards the moon. And the gravity of the moon pulls backwards on the Earth, and that causes the Earth's rotation to slow down. So all these watches are actually going to have the wrong time by the end of the day, because the, the Earth is losing time, about one millisecond uh, every 100 years. So uh, you, you have to correct that. Now, this is important over long time scales. As a consequence of this, the same reactions happened on the moon. The moon has slowed down in its rotation, so it's actually stopped rotating, or more correctly, it rotates exactly once in one orbit. That's why we only see one side of the moon. And the, the left image there is the, the dark side of the moon. It's not actually dark, it's actually brighter than the, the near side, and we don't understand why yet. That's an interesting puzzle. Looks very different from the, the near side. Now, 
One of the most prominent scientists who was doing theoretical astronomy in the 19th century was, was George Darwin. He worked out a lot of this theory in great detail. He was actually the smartest Darwin. Um, if you've ever read, uh, he was the, the son of Charles Darwin. If you've read The Descent of Man, you will know what I mean. He was a genius, was George. And what he did was work out a lot of these dynamics of the Earth-Moon system, showing how the moon got tidally locked. But what he did that was also interesting was he went backwards in time. If the moon is moving away from the Earth today, it should have been moving, it would have been closer to the Earth in the past, and the Earth should have been spinning more rapidly. And this led him to his own theory about the origin of the moon. At this time, there was, the main theory was that the moon was a captured object, just a random planet that had been captured by the Earth's gravitational field. That was ruled out by the composition of the moon rocks. The moon rocks tells us that the formation of the moon had to come somehow from the Earth. But what George Darwin, his theory is, is that if you go backwards in time, the Earth must have been spinning so fast that material would have been flung outwards from the rotation of the Earth. That material would have gone into space and condensed and formed the moon. Now, unfortunately, he couldn't come up with a way of spinning the Earth that quickly. And if, if you spun the Earth, if the Earth was spinning such that the length of day was just three hours, then we would literally levitate off the floor. And Darwin wanted to have a, a way of making the Earth rotate that fast, but he couldn't do it. So his, his theory sort of got left behind and ignored. And after the Apollo landings, scientists were trying to come up with a, a new model because the capture model had failed. So uh, what some astronomers came up with was the giant impact theory, which is illustrated here. A small planet about the size of Mars, about a tenth of the mass of the Earth, was postulated to have crashed into the Earth, knocking off part of the Earth's mantle, where there's no <clears throat> very little iron, the iron's in the core. That goes into orbit about the Earth and then condenses to, to, to form the Moon. Now, <clears throat> that's a wonderful idea, and it's been the leading theory since about 1980, for 40 years. But as simulations have got better, there's a problem with this model. It doesn't quite work. The moon rocks are just too similar to the Earth. They must have been once part of the Earth. There's no trace of the material that came from the colliding small planet. On the right there is actually a piece of rock from Mars. If you compare the isotopes of the elements in that rock, it's completely different to what's found on Earth or in the moon rocks. So that's a problem. Now we, we don't know how the moon formed. There's no model that works. So in the past, there's been just a few dozen computer simulations of the formation testing theories about how the moon formed. So um, my student and I have been using up a lot of time at the Swiss Supercomputing Center trying to simulate collisions between planets to try and understand and come up with a, a better theory. So here's just a, a snapshot of some of the simulations we've been running. About 10,000 simulations we've run so far. And um, the problem is the parameter space is so large. You've got the different masses of the planets. You've got uh, how much energy is in the collision. Then you've got the angle of the collision. Is it head on or slight, slightly off center? You've got the rotation of the bodies. There's 12 parameters. If we wanted to simulate the whole parameter space, we would need 10 to the 12 simulations, a, t a trillion simulations. And uh, that would take, you know, longer than my lifetime anyway. Um, so what to do, how, how, to, how to find the parameter space that could give rise to the moon using these simulations we have? Well, we turn to, to machine learning for this, and that's Miles Timpe there, who's actually done all this programming. He's a um, very smart guy, actually, graduating uh, this year, in case someone's looking for a, someone who can program ne neural networks before breakfast. So a neural network is, um, you know, it, it's, Typically, you know, Google use it to identify cat pictures by, you know, you take a picture, you split it into the color bands, and then you make pixels, you send that to an artificial neural network, and that finds pattern in your image data to then can be compared from a database to tell if your cat is a cat or if Miles is an alien, which he might be. Um, now, he, he's, he's 
fed our simulations database into this neural network, and then he's used something called a Latin hypercube, to, which um, is a way of pinning down interesting areas of parameter space. And I think we've actually found a model, a new model, for the formation of the moon. And George Darwin was right. It's not a collision between a small Mars-like planet. It was two equal-size mass planets, half the mass of the Earth, colliding into each other. Let me show you a simulation of that. On the left there, you see a close-up. It's a high angular momentum collision, so the planets spiral around each other, generating rotation. Then it merges together, and it's spinning rapidly. The length of day here is about three hours. It's enough spinning fast enough that it starts to shed material outwards. And in the right plot, I've highlighted the debris that gets thrown out into space. That debris is well mixed. It's a perfect combination of the two planets. It solves the reason exactly why the moon rocks are so similar to the Earth rocks. The material comes from the outer part of the merged planet. The iron has sunk to the center, so you just get an iron-free object forming in space. So I'm quite happy with that, actually. I, I, was, I was surprised that you could do such good stuff with these uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, but they really do help. Uh, now, you know, the, what's, what's next? What's, what's for the future? Well, we have to go back to the moon. And I'll just end on a little uh, video showing the lunar surface taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Satellite. So, by going back to the moon, we can test models of its origins, but there's other good reasons for going back to the moon, too. We want to build a lunar base there, so we can learn about the exploration of space. You know, getting to Mars is, is great, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. We don't understand how the human body behaves on a multi-year journey in space. So by having a permanent moon base, we can really begin our exploration of the rest of the solar system. And it's a great place to actually begin that journey, because on the moon, it's low gravity, it's easier to launch rockets to Mars and the stars beyond. And there's plenty of rocket fuel on the moon. There's billions of tons of water ice in the polar craters on the moon. Water is rocket fuel. With solar panels, you can split the water into hydrogen and oxygen and fuel your rockets. So there's some great reasons to go back. And now there is actually a new space race to the moon. Every major spacefaring nation on our planet has announced in the last couple of years they want to go back to the moon, to established lunar villages. And they want to do this within the next 10 years. And I think that's incredibly exciting. I'll stop there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.